the guy's got to stop. Whoa! Crap! Right, today we're going to have a look at uh, accidents and some of the things that we can flag up in our mind that may be uh, worth keeping a close eye on ourselves and indeed on others. And we'll have a look at a whole way, a bunch of ways of basically crashing our aircraft. Now, we're all vulnerable to accidents, whether it be ab initio, converting from nose wheel aircraft, and there's our first tail dragger, or whether we've been playing with these types of aeroplanes all of our lives. They're all either ignorance based if we're fairly new to it, or technique based if we come from something else, or over familiarity. And I know that I'm vulnerable, particularly to those sort of instances of over familiarity and maybe not taking quite as much care as I should. Because if you remember from the picture here, so the safe operation of our aircraft requires a continuous conscious effort to keep on top of what we're doing, to concentrate the routines that we set correctly, to not be distracted, not allow ourselves to be distracted, and to be vigilant with our whole operation. The problem is, and I know from my perspective, it's oh, oh so easy to get distracted. And distraction is one of the really big problems with aviation. I find that the most likely times to get distracted by people is either when I'm flying passengers or at something like a moth club rally where there are lots of people to talk to. When it comes to passenger flying, obviously you want to give them a good experience, but make sure that they don't interfere with the safety of actually how you're operating the aircraft and distract you from that primary task. Similarly, when you're at a rally, give people time to be of peace and quiet when they're actually looking at their aircraft, inspecting it or starting it. I would certainly benefit from people giving me just a little bit of space once I've stopped the aircraft or just before I'm about to go flying so that I can prepare for the flight properly without distraction. One of the biggest hazards of the Tiger Moth to start with or any of the Moth series is a propeller. It might seem really basic to say hey guys, be really vigilant out there with propellers. And anybody that's been operating, either flying or working on moths for most of their lives, if they're honest, will put their hands up and say that they're, but for the grace of God, do they go with a propeller accident. So let's just remember a couple of really simple rules that might help us keep it safe, is that propellers are always live. Well, you know that, because you learned that in theory. Remember when you put the switches on or off, when they go off, it actually makes a circuit to earth the magneto. If that switch fails or lead breaks in that earthing circuit, the propeller is live and ready to fire. And that's as important to remember where we're in the workshop, working on the aircraft, as it is actually out on the flying field. Several of my friends have been subject to an air engine firing while it's been in the workshop. And they'll tell you, it doesn't half hurt if you're lucky enough to care, stay out of the way of the blade with your body, that is. The second thing is when we're playing around with the engine when it's running. Remember a good lead for taking the chocks out of the way is always to walk along the leading edge of the wing, pull the chocks out, don't yank them, gently pull them out so they don't, if you yank them out there's a danger of them hopping into the propeller arc, winding the chocks in and maybe you on the end of it. So gentle squeeze and then reverse back along the wing. So during the starting process we must adhere to the drills and if we're using two people remember it's the person swinging the propeller who actually runs the operation and calls for the throttle and the ignition switches to be put in the right order. It's really important that if the aircraft doesn't start that the correct procedure is followed. When we're starting the aircraft and it doesn't fail to start then we put the ignition switch off and open the throttle to blow it out. Unfortunately, this is when quite a few accidents happen, particularly when people are starting the aircraft on their own. They get hot and bothered because they've been swinging the propeller, it's hot in the summer, they've got all their flying kit on, and they get a little bit tired and anxious and very hot. 
and uncomfortable. So they then lose sequence of what goes on. What happens then is that the guy goes back, puts the switches on, forgets to close the throttle, the aircraft starts up and it either tips straight over on its nose where it jumps the chocks and goes off flying on its own. And there have been quite a few that have had a go at that. So what I normally do when I'm starting the aircraft on my own is I make sure that the aircraft is chocked, that it's tied to something that's really hard to move. Like your car, put a strop between the tail skid and your car. That way you can start the aircraft up. Once it's warmed up, you can remove the chocks, go around, make sure the throttle friction nut is done up, untie your strop to the tail skid and safely get in. What can we do to make our moth flying a little bit safer the next time we go flying? Well, we can be quite happy to use a man on the wing. We can weave the aircraft as we taxi out and taxi at a speed which is commensurate with keeping control of the aircraft and looking and thinking ahead. Before we line up, we'll have a good look up the approach, a good look down the runway and think about what we're going to do if and when the engine should stop. During the takeoff roll, we'll raise the tail to the correct attitude, and then once the aircraft lifts off, select the correct climb attitude and keep a close eye on our speed as we climb. All the time thinking where are we going to go if and when the engine should stop. We can always improve our lookout, it's never good enough. So, with all that wing area and engine in front of us, be ready to move your head around to look behind the struts and rudder the aircraft to look behind the nose and under the chin of the aircraft. Think, where am I going to go should the engine stop? So keep a good eye out for those fields. Keep a good eye out, particularly when joining the circuit. Use the correct procedure to join the circuit and make sure that you know what's going on in the airfield. Remember that different aircraft have different performances. You are relatively slow and will have a relatively steep approach path, but it's quite easy to actually descend on top of another aircraft that's doing a powered approach. Similarly, aircraft such as Autogyros have a very steep and slow approach. So look above and behind particularly when turning base for those aircraft that are flying much longer finals or are higher or lower than you are. Fly your aircraft at the correct speed during the approach. Remember apparent attitude equals your performance. So keep an eye on your speed. Don't let it get fast but similarly don't get slow. Once it's very easy to relax just after the main wheels touch the ground and think the landing is over. It certainly isn't. Keep ruddering until the aircraft comes to a complete stop. Remember it's the last 20 miles an hour when the aircraft is most likely to get away from you. Similarly when taxiing in, taxi at a fast walking pace but weave the aircraft and don't taxi too fast to other obstructions. Remember that your ability to stop is seriously compromised compared with an aircraft with brakes. We'll just have a quick look and a refresher at the way that we deal with stress and then what that effect can have on our flying. So what do we mean by stress? Well obviously we can have a particular task being particularly stressful and focusing and narrowing our uh, mind and our availability to process and gather other information and data. But also we have life stresses built up by increments whether you got up in the morning with a hangover, whether the traffic was particularly busy going to work or driving to the airfield, whether you'd had a row with your partner, whether the aircraft was unfit or was at the back of a hangar and you had to shift a whole bunch of other ones out which you didn't expect before you got going, if the weather was different to what was forecast, everything builds up a little incremental level in your stress bucket. So, if we think of our capacity to deal with stress, it's like filling water into a bucket. 
to start with we've got lots more spare capacity if we've only gone to there we've got lots more capability to actually deal with things but gradually as the water or the stress level gets up to the top we eventually reach a state where we can't put anything more in and any more inputs just flow out over the side. Some of our capacity buckets may be smaller and some may be larger but whatever happens if we keep loading ourselves up we get to the state that our bucket is full and that's a really important concept to remember. The difficulty is being able to tell when our particular bucket is full because as it nears the top we lose our ability to recognise that we're actually getting overloaded. So what can we do to actually give ourselves a maximum capacity available in our bucket? Well that's what we're doing when we're planning what we're going to do. When we're thinking ahead then we're creating more capacity to deal with the unexpected. If we don't plan and we don't think ahead then our bucket will very quickly become overloaded when all the tasks suddenly come upon us at once. So what does that look like on a graph? We've got arousal along the bottom and performance up the side. If you're a flying instructor this is very poor use of colour largely because my workshop doesn't have any different coloured pens in it. But to start with when we're at a very low arousal state our performance is going to be low and gradually it will increase as our level of arousal goes up. But then we'll pick a peak and as we start getting overloaded our performance drops back down again. So obviously when we're flying we don't want to be in this area here but we surely also don't want to be in this area here. And we want to get ourselves to operate in that optimal level of arousal in that part of the curve because that's where our performance is going to be best. In the following few clips you may well see people operating here and think how often are you operating in there and what can you do to get yourself back into this area here. Here's a demanding approach flown into an uphill one-way strip. Remember this could be you or I. These guys are seriously focused and a demanding bit of aviation. Under severe stress, one of our first senses to go is our sense of hearing. And hence these guys didn't hear the gear up warnings horn. So let's get back to that landing in St Bart's. We all like to think that we're pretty observant and can multitask. But it's interesting how our brains soon start shutting out vast swathes of what would otherwise be compelling information. The option to go around doesn't seem to be there or considered throughout the whole of this event, but for the grace of God go you and I. We're going to look at a couple of non-aviation based activities. If you think you're really observant, and I'm sure you do just like I do, have a look at these next two exercises. I think you'll find it quite unsettling. This is an awareness test. How many passes does the team in white make? Go!
The answer is 13. But did you see the moonwalking bear? Very high workloads reduce our ability to absorb new information. Indeed, our stress levels may raise so high that our stress bucket is overflowing and we can't see what would otherwise to us be the bleeding obvious. So thinking about things on the ground is time well spent. Similarly, thinking up various scenarios that could occur in the air is time well spent. Where would I go if the engine stopped? What would I do if I had an engine fire? What would I do if I had a sick passenger? What would I do if the light was fading fast and I didn't have either time or fuel to get to my destination? Just coming up now is another clip that's to do with observation. Basically the problem is, if we're not looking for something or other, quite often we just won't see it. Have a look at this one. Clearly, somebody in this room murdered Lord Smythe, who, at precisely 3.34 this afternoon, was brutally bludgeoned to death with a blunt instrument. I want each of you to tell me your whereabouts at precisely the time that this dastardly deed took place. I was polishing the brass in the master bedroom. I was buttering his lordship's scones below stairs, sir. Why, I was planting my petunias in the potting shed. Constable, arrest Lady Smythe. Well, but, but how did you know? Madam, as any horticulturist will tell you, one does not plant petunias until May is out. Take oh. her away. Sorry, madam. It's just a matter of observation. The real question is how observant were you? Uh, action. Clearly, somebody in this room murdered Lord Smythe, who, at precisely 3.34 this afternoon, was brutally bludgeoned to death with a blunt instrument. I want each of you to tell me your whereabouts at precisely the time that this dastardly deed took place. I was polishing the brass in the master bedroom. I was buttering his lordship's scones below stairs, sir. I was planting my petunias in the potting shed. Constable, arrest Lady Smythe. In this next demonstration, we're going to look at the way that the eye and the brain can sometimes give illusions. What you're going to see is three yellow dots and a green flashing dot right in the centre of the screen. Concentrate on the flashing dot at the middle of the screen and tell me what you see with the yellow dots. But concentrate all the time on the centre flashing dot. Do you find that the yellow dots are flicking on and off intermittently? What I'd like you to do now is to open your gaze, take your head away from the screen a bit and look at the whole of the big picture and you'll see that the yellow dots are actually on continuously. It's an illusion. Well, I don't know about you, but I missed most of those changes the first time I saw that whodunit sketch. And there are lots of various visual illusions that can sucker us into holes in aviation. After all, it's not our natural environment. So maybe it's a lesson to us all to not to get too task focused to the exclusion of other bits around us such that we lose our situational awareness. Don't concentrate too much on the task in hand to the exclusion of other vital information. Here are some other pictures that you might find slightly daunting. How's this for a loss of situational awareness?
The frightening bit is, could it be you or I? I think it could be. The frightening bit is that most accidents seem to have happened many times before. I thought I had plenty of room to take off, sir. Famous last words, Saunders. Well, I've been coming in without looking, sir. Nearly collided with another fellow a hundred foot up. Must have got the wind up because he puts her nose up and turns and makes straight for the hangar. How he missed it, I can't think. And then he stalled. He's just about breathing, I suppose. The aircraft's written off, sir, I'm sorry to say. Another one who didn't look out. You know, thinking is easier done on the ground. Now imagine any one of you fellows has just landed and is about to taxi. What does a sensible chap do? At once he thinks about the job in hand, to taxi in. I may run into something. Hmm. Anything ahead? No. Port? No. Starboard? Oh yes, aircraft just landed. What will he do? Good, waiting for me. No. Wind, edge around a bit. Rever up, off we go. Just a moment, what's that crossing the tarmac? Looks like a petrol lorry. He's across. All right to port. All right to starboard. All clear behind. OK. Off he goes. Gently, smoothly, safely. Took him a long time. It only took him 30 seconds longer to make sure he had a clear run. Only half a minute longer to foresee possibilities. To anticipate trouble if there was any about. The windsock showed a pretty high wind, sir. Shouldn't he have had ground staff on his wingtip? Ah, good work, Wilson. As a matter of fact, it was fresh, but not too strong. All right for a sensible pilot. So he was okay on that score. Well, I was coming in behind another chap. A new fellow, I forget his name. He landed, so did I. There was a strongish wind, and it was also rather gusty. I saw the ground crew run out to help him taxi in. It didn't appear to be having any trouble in keeping the aircraft straight, so I thought I'd have a shot. Anyway, I felt a bit of a fool sitting out there, waiting for someone to come out and lead me in. Besides, I had a date. So you set off. A gust of wind caught your tail and swung you round. You gave her full throttle and used hard opposite rudder. No good. You opened your throttle a bit more. By this time you were roaring along. You went up on one wheel, your wing almost scraped the ground. And just as the flight commander and I were waiting for it, by sheer luck she righted herself. Somehow or other you managed to taxi the remainder of the way in. Having made one boo, you should have learnt your lesson and waited for someone to come and help you. Well, sir, I did manage it. Hmm. In one way, it's a pity you did. Good Lord, sir, why? Now you'll be tempted to do it again. And again, until you finally bend one. But how about those accidents where it's the other chap's fault? Such as? Well, I had a near one the other day, sir. I was just coming into land when suddenly another aircraft shot under me. True, the rule says the chap at the lower altitude has the right of way. But it was such a blatant piece of bad flying an infringement of circuit rules that I held on, and we landed almost together. Now, if anything had happened, sir, it would have been his fault, wouldn't it? Well, in the first place, yes. But two wrongs don't make a right. If he were BF enough to shoot under you, why should you be fool enough to risk a collision in the air by trying to beat him to it on the landing? It simply doesn't make sense. But you have given us a good example of what I mean by attitude of mind. From what you've said, I should imagine that your attitude of mind was... I'm going to make a very good landing. Everything under control. What was that? The ruddy fool. He can see I'm all set for a landing. And I jolly well am going to land. The extraordinary thing is that you're not both now seated on a fleecy cloud, arguing the matter out in between twanging your harps. I see the point, sir. Pupils like Charlie Sutton are similar to the curate's egg. Good in parts. Although Charlie made such a mess of his flight preparation, once he's in the cockpit, he does everything according to the book of rules. Checks all instruments, compass, altimeter, gyro, and remembers to ask himself, is the petrol on, trim, mixture, fuel? 
Got that all right. And he remembers to look out before starting off. Sutton is not in a hurry now. He's master of the aircraft and master of himself. You can easily define his attitude of mind. And there are hundreds like him, fellows who will become good pilots. Put them in an aircraft and they'll fly it, and fly it well. The trouble is they're careless in preparation, thoughtless about detail, and forgetfully, I don't think willfully, but forgetfully disobedient to flying regulations, circuit rules and procedure. They are the fellows who, sure as fate, will experience a crash that need never have occurred, a tomfool pileup. All good films have a trailer. You know the kind of thing I mean, stupendous attraction, smash hit, with cuts from the film itself. We had a trailer made, but decided to put it on at the end, just to be different. It's entitled, ready, Henry? All ready, sir. Entitled, these were their last words. I thought I had plenty of room to take off. I thought there was no need to bother about a map forecast. We don't need a map for that little bit. I think we've got enough petrol to make it. Oh, hell, let's have a crack at it. By gad, I forgot to set the altimeter. These last words have become famous, but their speakers have just faded away. The majority of you fellows will, I know, make these words your guiding motto throughout your training. Obedience to flying regulations is the safest and quickest way to your next step up the ladder towards the height of every pupil's ambition. Flying in fighter or bomber, sweeping the skies of the world. Just one more word. Stick to the rules. Good luck.